that the title of this talk is Building Multiple Chains Application and Tools, Tips and Tricks from Interoperability and Innovators. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, I hope you're ready for this talk and had a good break. Um, for today's talk about multi-parachain interoperability and all together, I would start out, let's do an introduction with everybody to give us a bit of background on what projects you're working on. I think it's important for everybody who is in here and not necessarily know you guys already, um, what you're building on, and then we can take it from there on what you're building in terms of interoperability and how this matches all together and what challenges you're facing. And that's kind of like what the goal of the, this panel should have is to give everybody a bit of an understanding where we are standing when it comes to multi-chain interoperability and challenges and maybe one, you can take one or the other suggestion to not fall into the same pitfalls that these guys who have like years of experience building on it um, and went through the pain points. So maybe Anton, you're going to start what, you, what you're working on, what you're building. Um, yeah, sure. Oh, that's loud. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Anton. I'm from Nova Summit Technologies. Uh, we have two products mainly right now, No Wallet leading mobile application for the Polkadot and Nova Spectre being all-in-one desktop wallet. So when it comes for the cross-chain transfers, I think we've been first mobile wallet for sure uh, introducing them for the ecosystem. Uh, and just today we have released the update for our desktop app introducing the cross-chain transfer. So we'd be happy to discuss it. Nice, very nice. Uh, what about you, Jonathan? Uh, hey, uh, I'm Jonathan. Uh, I'm from Talisman. And like Nova, we're building a wallet. Uh, but where we differ is we're building a browser extension uh, so you can connect to dApps on the fly. And we've also got a web dashboard where you can submit a lot of the cross-chain interactions that we're going to be talking about, like uh, transfers and crowd loans uh, via that interface. And soon we'll be having a multi-signature dashboard coming out uh, later this year. Nice. And hey, I'm Jakub. Um, we're building Basilisk and Hydra DX, and both are decentralized exchanges, parachains. Uh, one is on Kusama, one is on Polkadot. Uh, one is catering for long tail of assets, one is more of a, um, assets that are vetted. And we want to build infrastructure for, for transactions, for paying for fees for transactions in the Polkadot ecosystem. And we are also quite interested in end user UX. So uh, this is a great talk. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm James. I work for a team called Subquery. Um, I also do a bit of work for a team called OnFinality as well. So both of these are infrastructure players. One is a data indexer, which is um, a tool that teams like Nova and Talisman and even HydroDX use to um, index information from the chain to build these applications. So we're a bit more of the uh, picks and shovels aspect of this discussion, uh, but still very important in terms of providing these tooling, um, and these tools across uh, the different um, parachains within Polkadot. Nice. Um, quite a big range of different teams and different kind of like users you guys are addressing um, with the products that you're building. Let's start out with maybe the elephant in the room. What is the definition of a multi-parachain application actually? And how do you have different views on it? And how do you define it from the wallet perspective, from the parachain perspective, and from, say, like the data and indexer perspective? Anybody who wants to share his views? Yeah, I think I, I can jump in. Uh, I believe that the multi-chain applications really, truly shined. Um, when the Polkadot launched the parachains. Uh, because if you took a look on the wallets, um, which have been around before, like a no wallet and others, you would most likely uh, face the wallet which requires you to switch the networks every time. So here is you on one network, and to manage assets on another one, you need to go like somewhere and switch the networks. With the Polkadot, however, you started to see wallets and the apps which provide you truly multi-chain experience. And by that, I mean that on the one screen, you have multiple networks, most likely in the real time, updating the balances for all of the assets inside of each. So I would say that the multi-chain application is the one which connects um, in the real time to the multiple networks. OK, so you have literally a floating world of 
tokens and assets, and you don't really care about chains anymore. Well, you, you care about more than one chain, right? Oh, okay. At yeah. least. That's a good definition. Yeah. I would probably imagine it as you would use your Facebook or something else or your banking system, and you wouldn't even care that you are on this blockchain or this blockchain, but everything under it will be done automatically through XCM, and you don't need to even like exchange tokens because Hydra will do it for you, and these guys will implement it. So, <laughs> so that will be amazing that like as a user you can come from one application to second one you don't need even like their tokens and know, know anything about it and just use it like web 2 basically but like polkadot is kind of um this is quite important to, to the message of polkadot right which is this multi-chain multi-parachain aspect um that your assets here can move over here and then do something over there and come back over here that you can jump between these parachains seamlessly because they speak the same language, that these parachains can talk to each other using XCM. Um, and for that to uh, manifest itself up for end users, the user experience has to be as seamless as possible between these parachains. Um, even still MetaMask, right, when you want to go to different EVM chains, you have to kind of change the network. And imagine if we've got 80 parachains and Every time you do something over here, then you have to change your network, and suddenly everything refreshes, and a brand new list of of assets come up, and it looks different, it feels different, and you have to do this mental mind shift to go from this parachain to this parachain. That's not going to work at the scale that Polkadot's trying to operate in. And so that's why building applications that kind of obfuscate the, the, the parachain aspect is probably going to be quite important in terms of the user experience. Um, especially to bring in new people. That's a very nice explanation. Do you, like one question is like, do you differentiate between multi-chain in off-chain and on-chain? Because a lot of data indexing is happening off-chain nowadays, and it's a provider for application most of the time. Um, but then you have AMM stuff is on-chain, obviously, completely, and the wallets are interacting with on-chain as well. Is it is it differently? Is the view on it on a multi-chain environment differently, or you say it's always very similar in terms of the interaction and the user from the application standpoint? Well, I guess from the user perspective, it's always the multi-chain experience. Uh, behind the scenes, of course, we connect it to each of the chain individually, right? And if you talk about the indexers, we have to maintain either each uh, indexer for each um, chain. Or recently, subquery, uh, well, not recently, <laughs> quite a while ago, uh, started to do the um, multi chain projects. And together with, with subquery, we actually built multiple uh, multi chain projects. For example, one of them allows you to receive in a single endpoint the staking API in each of the supported networks, like Polkadot, Kusama, and others. Right? So, single endpoint, but at the same time, it's connected to the multiple indexers, and you're fetching the, all the information about the staking, like API, total rewards, all that stuff. Uh, and generally, the mindset for the applications, I believe that whenever you can receive something uh, cheap from the chain itself, then do it, because that's uh, the source of truth. Uh, whenever it's not comfortable, for example, for the operation history, for the staking rewards, you have to use the indexers, like subquery, for example. So here's that. Any comments? Yeah, you both. Uh, Jonathan? Yeah. Um, Anton's right. From user's perspective, it's all multi-chain. Um, but when you're engineering these applications, I, think, I guess there is a little bit of difference between how you deal with information that's on-chain versus off-chain where it is quite easy, as you said, to kind of engineer yourself one endpoint to get lots of data that was off-chain and has been indexed by, by somebody like subquery. Um, but when you're trying to get live information from a network, it's probably best to just open up a bunch of connections to a bunch of uh, RPC nodes. And it's a different, a different challenge, maybe, um, from an engineering perspective. Even though it seems the same as a user, this, come, this information has come on the chain, and this has come from an indexer. Um, there is a distinction when you when you start to build these applications. As a developer of the apps, and as you are also, I would hope so that this data in the future will be available on chain. I'm sure that Subsquid is working on something like that, and 
I would hope that we would have like one data source for both the on-chain data and the off-chain data together. However, this is not yet possible because you cannot trust, like, you cannot completely trust the off-chain data yet. But this would be like, if we build this, then then uh, all of the applications can be built uh, in a similar way, which which would be much simpler. You would just build an indexer and processor, and then get the data from one trusted data point, like a data center, which would be some kind of network in the ecosystem. And then, yeah, this this would be my dream uh, to to develop. But as you can hear, right behind the scenes, um, all of these teams, uh, you can't rely on purely on indexes. You can't rely on purely on on-chain data that's retrieved through RPCs. It's always a combination of both. And um, in terms of developing this, you can still at this moment, you can still open up. 80 WebSocket connections to eight different parachains and make requests for balances, for example, which is, I understand how you guys get balances right now. If a user opens up um, a wallet, they see all their, it's, it's a web, you open WebSockets to each. Yeah, it's each, for each chain, it's WebSocket connection. That's correct. But then historical information that you can't get from an RPC, that has to come from Indexer. So it's always going to be a combination of both. Um, it's about knowing when to use one versus the other. Uh, how are we going to scale this to a thousand parachains if we're opening AD connections right now, RPCs? And it, it doesn't it at the moment. I mean, we, we run into this limit all the time at Talisman where there's more and more parachains come online and we get closer and closer to this like browser-defined limit of the number of WebSocket connections you can have open at a particular time. But then it just becomes an, like, an engineering challenge for, for the wallets to kind of maybe open one, retrieve a balance, close it again, open another, and close it again. Um, we've also got a feature coming to Talisman in the next version that allows a user to just say, I don't care about this network. Like, Never try and get a balance from this network. And then that saves us a bit of compute and a bit of time. Um, so I don't know, just an engineering challenge if we're going to scale it. And maybe it's going to be more interesting with Agile core time when they're being like, D dozens and dozens more of these paras. Yeah, yeah. What is the limit right now? I actually don't know. I know we're close to it, so it's got to be you up. You know, you know, tell us. It's got to be up near like 100, 100 and something uh, website yeah. connections for a browser. Yeah. I don't know if it's different for mobile wallets, though. Is yeah. It different? We actually, like, before, like, the first versions of the No, we were not multi chain. It was just like, the old school wallet applications when you needed to switch between the Polkot and Kusama. And before jumping into something like promising to the community that we can deliver the multi-chain mobile application, because yeah, you have the mobile phone, you definitely resource limited, right? So how can we know that will it handle the hundred of the parachains? So we just we started to the bench uh, benchmark the mobile device and the code. And it turned out that the numbers are quite different between the Android and iOS. Initial numbers were that we could support 150 parachains, not parachains, the networks, right? And with the time, we started to optimize things. But again, coming back to the question itself, uh, I think the Jonathan Wright, uh, we actually planning to do the similar way. We're going to suggest the default set of the networks, which will be um, enabled by default for the user, right? And then user can go in the settings and enable uh, any of the parachains that basically no one knows in the config files. Uh, that allows us not only like to be in a safe space, but also to increase the performance of the user. Because for the mobile devices, uh, you can imagine that it's it's pretty wild west in terms of like the variety of them, right? You have the uh, iPhone devices which are pretty fast, but you also have the Android devices which can be pretty much old and users still using them, right? So we have to take into account uh, every aspect of this. I think that you could slightly overcome this problem by just getting initial state from the RPC itself. And then maybe if you interact with one or two chains more often, or you see it on the screen, you will open the WebSocket connections. And then, but this is like a huge engineering effort to just get it working. And I would hope that we, we will see like SDKs and stuff that will actually do this for you. And we need to build this together. So. <laughs> One question that comes to my mind: Have, have you, pro or would it be possible, or would, like the whole, Lightland small dot application, 
help to at least fetch sort of like the initial state? I mean, not history, but sort of like, you know, when the user opens the application, then you run it through a couple of networks, fetch it, or is this out of scope from performance-wise? Yeah, for the light clients, the situation is a bit worse. <laughs> like uh, a year ago, the modern laptop could run only like, um, I think it's six of the light clients free. <laughs> the team is telling me free. So free for um, networks could be run simultaneously for the light clients. Things got changed pretty dramatically. Uh, nowadays, uh, I think we spoke with the party research team and they provided us numbers that up to 25 networks can be now connected with the light clients simultaneously. Uh, but we have not yet ki kind of played around it. Uh, but here is that. Uh, and you also need to take into account that whenever you deal with the light clients, there is a certain time that you need to bootstrap the light client, right? So yeah. the machine is spending resources on that as well. Yeah, OK, that makes sense. Um, we talked a lot in terms of interacting with the multi-chain environment. I mean, I'm looking to you, Jakob, maybe for, from, a, from a parachain perspective. Like multi-chain could also be you have services that are used on other platform. Like servers, I mean, for example, very simple, a swap functionality that is used on, on a different parachain by utilizing the functionalities that built on, on natively on, on, on Hydrodex. Um, do you see something like that? And do you see that, or what are the challenges right now to, to build these composable use cases that really utilize the multi-chain environment? Uh, definitely what everybody else has. Um, we think about it all the time, but if you just take a simple XCM cross-chain transfer UI, you have a lot of setup that you need to manage and have and know about each chain to be actually able to send just a simple message through through a few of the other chain I'm sure you guys know. So like abstracting these things to SDKs that would be commonly like um, maintained uh, is probably a way to go because otherwise it will be very hard. Every parachain would actually need to know about every other parachain, what they can do. And so maybe like abstractions through XCM actually will help. So XCM would be used on all of the parachain to do basic stuff like transfers or exchanges of tokens and then transferring it somewhere else, like a basic language. And um, that is also very helpful. But we also need for the front-end developers or application developers, this to be easy. Because right now, you probably need to be half of a runtime developer to, to actually use this stuff. Yeah, I can very well imagine that. Is that something that the, the wallet could provide in the future? Say, like, I mean, if I plug into your wallet, into my homepage, I'm kind of like abstracting and making it very easy, I get a standard set of XEM functionalities that at least allow me to kind of send around parachain native tokens between a bunch of parachains. And I don't have to maybe even understand XEM in the nitty gritty on how the, the whole call is constructed, but more like, I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's para ID, it's asset ID, sending wallet, a receiving wallet. That is the minimal that you need, and now I'm uh, I'm stopping. But is this something that could be actually from sort of I'm seeing it as infrastructure provider, say like wallet becoming infrastructure provider as in a multi-chain environment and enabling application builders to e easier interact with the multi-chain network. <laughs> Interesting, <laughs> because right now we have to build uh, the cross-chain transfer, for example, yeah. by ourselves, and it implies knowing a lot of variables, because the cross-chain transfer from the Polkadot to Hydrodix, it's one type of the cross-chain transfer. Uh, the cross-chain transfer from Hydrodix to, let's say, the Bifrost, it's whole another cross-chain transfer. And not only the type is different, uh, the pallets which are behind the scenes are used for the cross-chain transfers can be different. For example, I know that Astar folks and the Fala folks, they're using um, pretty much customized version uh, of the pallets, so not um, the usual one. Uh, the old coefficients for calculating the fees right also varies from chain to chain and from the token to token. So you have to take into account as well. So it 
multiple variables that you need to take as a developer before constructing um, the cross-chain, uh, for example, transfer. Yeah, I, I think that's probably the main challenge for wallet developers at the moment and, and application developers at the moment. Isn't that XCM is like a, a really high bar to understand? It's really, really complicated. It's just that there are like half a dozen of these wrapper palettes. You know, it's like Polkadot XCM on the relay chain, and there's X tokens, and then you have to know which palette you need to call an extrinsic con for each network in order to do the transfer. And having that as like a standardized interface might might be a kind of a, a bit of an enabler for application developers make it a little bit more easy. And um, I think there's an effort to, to do that where um, XCM is just the standard for like all token transfers. So you may, it doesn't necessarily need to be cross-chain. You can say uh, destination chain is the relay chain. I'm actually already on the relay chain. It's just different addresses. And so every time you do a token transfer in Polkadot, it's like constructed with the XCM language. Um, and that would, I think that would go a long way to standardize a lot of these use cases for application devs. I think there are actually two, one or two forum posts on the Polkadot forum about, I think one is from Sean, I, I remember pre, where he actually explains the XCM can also be used to, not always needs to get used for cross-chain, but it can also be used for a single chain call. Um, and then I think Rob or somebody talked about dialects or something to standardize interfaces to palettes and through XM. Yeah, I, I don't know much about the Rob one, but the Sean one was kind of funny. I spoke to him about it. And he, he said he was talking to Gav. Um, and Sean was like, we need to standardize everything. You know, it's really difficult for, for engineers to talk to these palettes and do XCM. Like, there needs to be a standard. Like, how are we going to set about this effort to, like, define the standard, implement the standard, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's kind of lots of hand waving. And then Gav was like, shrugged his shoulders. He was like, oh, just XCM is the standard. <laughs> and then that's, I think that's how it came about. <laughs> Good story. Um, so did it happen? I think it's still on the forum just, just discussing. <laughs> I think you need to be able to like read XCM as well as write or something like that. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. Is this a case of like the XCD, is KCD comic where they're like, we need, there's too many standards. We need another standard. <laughs> yeah. And now there are N plus one standards. But reading is possible with XCM 4, I think. It's, it's one of the features that gets implemented to read foreign state as far as I know. Um, very nice. It's slowly happening, yeah. It's slowly happening, OK. OK, we touched already on, on a couple of challenges um, of cross-chain um, interface and different sort of like inter interfaces and possible solutions on what could be, could help a lot from wallet to parachain, from indexing. What are the, the most exciting use cases that you see right now, if you would, rem would need to mention one or two? that is really utilizing cross-chain, either like because it's super nice from a user perspective, or it's just like because it's utilizing the technology in its utility function. Yeah, I guess I can start. Uh, yeah, we have something on top of uh, my head. Uh, we're going to integrate the, um, uh, what is the name of the swap palette? Of the swaps, it was named the dot swap, right? Uh, on a Polkadot asset, asset conversion, asset conversion palette on the Polkadot asset hub. <laughs> so we're going to provide the interface for that uh, in the No Wallet. And the interesting thing is that um, whenever you build, like even the swap feature on the Polkadot, right? You automatically out of the box uh, have opportunity to build it on the next level. So the asset hub swaps happening on the asset hub network, right? But the user, whenever they open the, let's say, no world user interface, they are able to select tokens not only on the Polkot asset hub, but let's say from the HydroDX. And then they can uh, select that they would like to receive the tokens on the Astar. So what will happen behind the scenes is that the swap itself will happen still on the Polkot asset hub on the asset conversion palette, right? But the no wallet behind the scenes will compose the bunch of extrinsics, basically cross-chaining the assets from the HydroDX to the Polkot Asset Hub, executing the swap, and then uh, uh, executing another cross-chain transfer from the Polkot Asset Hub to the Astar. So that will be desired um, 
operation for the user basically done in a single flow, right? They just selected one token, another token, and hit the swap. That's it, right? But in behind the scenes happened like three operations. And on the blockchain, it actually not only three operations, but potentially like even more. Uh, that's interesting. So you basically, you utilize Asset Hub as a router between different chains. But not just as a router, you also enable the swap functionalities within that route that you could literally swap from, well, any token that is supported by asset conversion um, and is most probably supported on the sending chain and the receiving chain. And then the fun happens when we have a Hydrodex, because now you can plug in the Hydrodex here, and now you can optimize the race for the user, right? So. You can cross-chain uh, transfer to the Hydrodex, do the swap there, then on the Polkot Asset Hub because it has more liquidity in a certain pair, and then the cross-chain uh, transfer to another network. So you have this like multiple operations happening, and again for the user it's just like one screen. They selected one token, another token, and that's it. Okay, so that's basically an extension from that what we said before, because as as a conversion is not built to be uh, economic performant or efficient, the most economic efficient, you could integrate the functionalities of Hydrodex in between to aggregate literally the, the cost efficiency of the swaps and still use the routing through, through Asset Hub, if that is my, a, a right summary of what you just said. Yeah, I mean, that's amazing. Like the best, I, so far the best use cases are probably the wallets like a cross-chain wallet that can access all the stuff. But this is a step closer to what I proposed before. Like uh, if you can at the same time do governance action or do something else on some, some other chain, we are getting closer to where we are abstracting completely having any asset on any chain. And that is for me really exciting because it will allow much greater UX for, for any application. Are there a lot of UX, or are you guys aware of a lot of UX development to literally, or maybe not even development research to improve the interface for the end user in how to inter how the UI needs to look like in this new world? I mean, what I what I would say like we had this discussion a lot with with Ledger is like you have this. Ledger's the apps which are built for a single chain, interact with a single chain, and now we're going into this new world that we've been talking quite a lot about, but is a completely different mindset on how to interact with it. And I'm wondering if you're aware of teams actually working on on how this should look like. I think these three teams are pioneering that discussion right now, right? These are yeah. the three teams that are most leading the charge. Um, wallets, um, exchanges, DEXs, um, governance applications as well are doing a bit of this, but they still kind of focus at the moment on you swap between the chain when you're looking at. Scanners are still swapped between the chain. There's some um, tools out there that allow you to see your entire balances, um, like sub.id, for example. But yeah, it, it, it seems in this room are kind of leading the charge there. Yeah. And I don't think anyone's got any guidelines on how to do this. It's just we're, we're experimenting what works well and what doesn't. Yeah, definitely. Makes a lot of sense. Um, so what works well? Uh, iterating, testing, put like you still need to do a product research and you like up front. Uh, you need to have a good designer that understands crypto and like uh, the logical stuff behind this because you cannot design some screens because of the technical limitations yet. But yeah, then you put it out and hear the, hear the feedback of the people and, and do surveys and, and iterate on the designs to make it better. Yeah, Jakob's right. I think it's like perfect ground for iterative product development process that a, a regular product company would follow. Um, but I don't know user patterns that have been successful or like have seemed like a good idea so far is to give the user a sense that they're just interacting with Polkadot. Like they're not in necessarily interacting with Parachain A or B or C. It's just a big smush of networks called the Polkadot ecosystem that they're interacting with. And you can kind of present this in a portfolio um, in the way that you display assets. Um, and there are things that like help with this. Like there's no notion of a wrapped asset really when you're transferring assets between chains. 
if you go from like uh, one network to another in Ethereum, you might end up with a wrapped version of that asset on your destination chain, and that's a different line item in the portfolio. But when you transfer DOT from the relay chain to Hydra, for example, it's still DOT, and you can represent that in a, in a nice kind of inclusive way um, in, a, in like a portfolio view for a wallet. So you know, that's one pattern that seems to have caught on, and a couple of teams have followed suit. Um, but yeah, other than that, I think Jakob's right. Just try stuff out, measure it, do more of what works. How do you balance the needs of like providing that seamless, unified Polkadot experience, but also allowing these parachains to have their own brand identity in Tadra app? Uh, you can combine them. So you can show this nice, inclusive way as a portfolio view, but the actual asset management would be divided in this branded network section way. Step further would be to come up with UX, which allows you to manage assets from this portfolio view. Because right now, let's imagine you have like a dot on the Polkadot Aster Hydrodex, right? And then you want to send some Polkadot tokens to, I don't know, the Bifrost, for example, right? Now, the wallet needs to understand how many tokens to take from the Polkadot, from the Astar, and from the Hydrodix, because you have a dots on all of them, right? And this is a challenge. This is a solvable challenge, right? But it takes a bit of research how to approach it. Uh, on the top of my head, there is also a funny case, I would say, with the cross-chain transfers. Uh, I want to share it. So whenever we started to develop the cross-chain transfers, we noticed that the existing user interface which was calling it teleport, was doing some weird stuff. So whenever you enter the one dot, let's say, you will receive not one dot, but you will receive 0 0.9999 and something, right? Because whenever you compose the cross-chain transfer uh, or cross-chain operation, basically doing its execution on the multiple networks, all the network that it touches, you basically pay the fee, right? So. It initially started as a one dot, but then it touched one network, and it took some fee for it, and then another, another, and it resulted in something like 0 0.99. And it's it's such a bad UX because it's it's visually not appealing, right? Because you now have a wallet having like 0 0.999 and all these numbers, right? But also, which is crucial, like let's imagine that some project decides to do like e-commerce and they would like to utilize the cross-chain features, right? And now you have a customer and a consumer. Um, and basically, customer and the buyer, sorry. And basically, the customer pays the 10 dot, but the shop receives 9.99, right? So that's bad. So we decided to also like approach this by really precisely calculating the fee so that whenever the user enters one dot, we actually add enough commission so that on the like destination side it will arrive like precisely one dot. So it's basically it's very hard to actually measure on how much overhead fees you need to exactly. to take it from the origin count to make sure that you have a, a an exact that a exact amount arrives on your receiving chain. Yeah, it's in some cases it's impossible. So you will end up sending a little bit more, right? But a little bit more is much better than if you will not send it. Uh, like for whom? But <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, we are saying about like a small amount. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, it's not it's not hard. It's complex because you have to always calculate the fees precisely for each networks depending on the pallets and all that. So multiple variables that you need to take into account. Nice, nice. Um, I mean, that's all the center. That's the experience that you guys have gathered, right? By actually building something. Um, and trying it out, and we touched on the XCM composability, like creating XCM call com complexity, and um, touched on sort of like fee calculation and making sure that the right direction. Any other tools that you that you could think of that would be useful, or there is an idea based on your experience that you've what you have built and what you have been interfacing so far? And well, Anton touched on this before, right? We, at Subquery, we put a lot of, um, we put a lot of effort into building multi-chain indexing. And the reason why is that, look at all these wallets, for example, they're showing a unified look into all your assets and all these different exchange chains or parachains. So you don't, you don't switch between 
the parachains, and we've kind of we've discussed how the the UX kind of world in the space is tending towards this view of this one view of polka dot, um, and so multi-chain indexing means that rather than your browser or your mobile app having to make 80 requests for 80 different parachains, 80 different index data sets, you index all that data into one single endpoint, one single database which you can make one query for. So you can say, give me everything related to this account. Give me all their staking information, all their rewards, um, their you know, swap histories, their balances, this stuff. Because that's really the way that the UX needs to be. And so therefore, that's the way that we've had to build the indexer. And so um, for people that want to build that unified interface, that's a real big um, benefit that we're seeing specifically in Polkadot being taken up. Very nice, yeah, that's very cool. And it's also one endpoint by now or something, right? You can get all the information of the whole network of, of chains at, at the end yeah. of the day. So Nova, for example, built a, a staking data set, which gives you, was it rewards, staking balances? Yeah, it's total rewards, it's stake amount, and the APY for each uh, network that has staking, yeah. All in one endpoint. So you put your single account in, and you get everything across all these different Parachains. Yeah, nice. Very cool. Uh, that would be great for the data that you've indexed and is now off-chain. Um, but one thing that I think the secret system needs more of is when you're trying to get information live from the chain, just like more lightweight tooling for the JavaScript and TypeScript side to kind of query the chain state, uh, submit extrinsics. Because most of the application ecosystem relies on the old Polkadot.js API, and it's kind of enormous type registry. Uh, so if you want to kind of use that in your application, you can really only create like two or three instances of it before you start running into some trouble. Um, so some more kind of lightweight tools to craft extrinsics, represent the typing information for the chain, um, allow you to submit those would be great, because then you can suddenly start to care less about uh, how large that is and just hack your way to, to your use case. Maybe that's an idea for someone out here to build. Actually, um, the, the TX wrapper libraries um, are, are good for this because they kind of have the typed information already because it's for offline transaction crafting. So I would take a look at those. And also Subshape, which was built by uh, the Capi team um, a few months ago, is, is really cool. So uh, definitely progress here. What was that? Uh, Subshape. Ah, uh, OK. Yeah, yeah, OK. Mm, I would maybe also add Subsquid, which is also indexer. And they are doing it slightly differently. You, you build these processors. And actually, with the new version, you can uh, directly like connect to RPC nodes to get the index data, which is kind of neat. Um, and then maybe Polkaholics has a huge database of cross-chain uh, information, XCM. Um, all of the channels open and, and stuff like that. So this might be very useful for, for cross-chain the apps. Uh, and I wanted to give a shout out to Alexi from Interlay, <laughs> because he suggested one of the greatest tool, oh, well, not the greatest tool, one of the nicest tool that I saw in another ecosystem, but basically we need this in a Polkadot. That would be a simple dashboard, which shows you all the parachains, as well as the real chains. Uh, all the active connections, uh, XM connections between them, right? Uh, in the real time, how many transfers going from one chain to another, right? So it will be it will be looking like a fancy map of the ecosystem, right? With a dynamic messaging going from one network to another, with some statistics, right? And maybe even UI to do the cross chain transfer, for example, because if you have a tool which has all this information, maybe you can yeah plug the cross chain transfer functionality there. I would maybe add one more indispensable tool, which is Chopsticks from uh, Brian from Akala. Yeah. And you can simulate, uh, you can just copy the state of any parachain co and then s simulate anything you want on the chain with uh, custom accounts. And this is very helpful for the development in front end one. Um, I'll throw one more in there. And I think um, you wallets, you guys publish like lists of kind of metadata around different chains, right? You publish lists of RPC interfaces. Chain types, even names, logo files, that kind of like when you're dealing with 80 parachains, you're trying to integrate that. It's just a pain in the ass to do all that admin work, which you guys have already done and you publish on, on GitHub. Uh, That's yeah. correct. 
Yeah, we've got a repo called Chain Data, if you want to check it out. Um, it's a big JSON file of all of the metadata for the chains. And there are a couple of others for test nets and tokens and things like this, but uh, free to use. For our site, it's called Novo Utils. And it's basically the huge repo with multiple configs. Like you have a chains with description of the nodes, um, basically uh, the block explorers, all the features that are allowed in the network. But we also have the separate files for the cross-chain transfers, so the configs, the, um, all the coefficients that you need to build the cross-chain transfers. Feel free to check it out. It, it's uh, novasamatech slash nova-utils. And you will find the cross-chain uh, configs there. Nice. So Chopsticks is literally to create a uh, developer environment with chain state um, locally. And metadata data is for anybody who wants to interact with any chain, can see what assets, number, logos, and, and how to interact is from maybe front end side, I would say, in that sense. Nice. Um, a, lot of, a lot of stuff to do. It get, doesn't get boring. Um, and thanks for sharing all of your knowledge. I would say, like, to kind of wrap it up, I mean, we talked a lot of multi-chain, we touched a lot of use cases, a lot of problems. How, how, would you, how would you guys see the future looks like in multi-chain when we come back together in 12 months? And what is it, what is it different from tooling perspective and from end-user application perspective, I would say? Either or or both if you have ideas. Whoever wants to go first, just get crazy with your ideas how the future might look like. I would like to see at least one DEX aggregator in the ecosystem that is seamless. Maybe one of you can build it, <laughs> guys. <laughs> like a DEX aggregator that is kind of like a one inch where you just say what you want to do and it kind of like tries to figure out the routes underneath it? Yeah, we will. As I mentioned, right, so we're going to build it now in the Nova. First, we build the DEX, and then we're going to do this fancy stuff with the cross chains, like adding it. Um, but it also comes with, it's not that easy, right? It's not that you just do the DEX and you throw the bunch of cross chain transfers and you're done, right? Imagine that the user started to do this and then the internet goes offline or they decided to close the app. Just because it's not one huge big atomic operation, it's multiple operations that needs to be sent in a sequent order, which means that user device, be the browser extension of the mobile app, has to be online. And it has to always see that, yeah, previous transaction was executed. I can start and do the next one. So it's kind of like a state manager required to build now in the, the wallet app, right? So there are lots of challenges coming to, like, to embrace the power of the Axiom world, but the benefits are huge. I, I kind of like, I think if you're launching a new parachain or you're building a new custom palette, I think one thing to do is always talk to the talk to the wallets, for example, talk to these other applications that are kind of cross chain apps or cross parachain apps, like when you do that, because these guys deal with the, the shit part of it. The, the, um, the other ones having to integrate it and make it work. And I kind of say this too much almost that the success of Polkadot as a whole is greater than the sum of its parachains. And so having parachains that don't talk to each other, don't work for each other, is only going to hurt Polkadot. Um, having everyone, have all these parachains work well, interoperate well, these, these tools that work across the different uh, parachains themselves is really important to the success of Polkadot. And so making sure that these applications that do do this kind of cross-parachain behaviors, uh, making sure that they can work with you is going to be quite important to that. Yeah, um, one thing that I hope we can see more of come sub zero 2024 is like a more like diverse set of cross chain interactions. I mean, XCM v3 has been out. I remember we spoke about it sub zero last year. It was like we had a panel of talking about XCM v3. And one of the um, talking points was suddenly the actions can be a little bit more composable. Like you can try and um, have a like a more programmable call to to better functionality on the destination chain. Receive an error back if it if it fails or something like that. And that opens up like a rich set of possibilities for cross chain interactions beyond just transferring tokens. And then we kind of hear it's like we're talking about transferring tokens again. Um, so it'd be cool to see a more diverse set of cross chain interactions where it doesn't need to be like a bunch of atomic 
token transfers. It's actually just kind of native on, on the parachain. So um, yeah, I would love to see that. I think that's um, remote locking or something. That was one that we discussed a lot, right? But you don't actually have, I mean, for functional functionalities happening on a parachain, you don't necessarily always have to send the asset, actually. You can just send calls from the asset and trigger some event on the other parachain to do something. Um, yeah, it would be cool to see a lot of them. Totally agree. And uh, SDKs on top of it. I would like to maybe reemphasize what uh, Robert said. Like, to succeed, we need to build together. W what kind of SDKs? Can you be a bit specific? Uh, like um, abstracting all of this, like, uh, your library, make it open and uh, encourage everybody to actually contribute to it and stuff, stuff like this. Make a repo where everything sits together, like, awesome, awesome. Uh, the app building on Substrate and, and uh, have it there for people to, to test it out. Yeah, totally agree. Um, I would wrap it up with that. I think we got a lot of insights. Um, we have, I see we have three minutes left here. I might open it f up for a question if there is any question in the audience or listeners and see what the answer for it is. Hi, uh, thank you for the discussion. Uh, we talk about a lot of tokens, but I have a, a question regarding the authentication and also maybe the sign, the process signing of a batch of transactions that come from different uh, uh, chains. Uh, what's your tips and tricks, uh, I don't know, to maybe create an account for the user in the background or, or maybe sign each transaction separately, well, I don't know. Do you have some techniques uh, around authentication and signing? Um, well, as a wallet, we're just kind of a key store, and we have some code that can apply a signature to a, like a valid transaction. Um, unfortunately, most substrate chains support the like SR25519 key pair type. So you can really just create one key pair for the user, and it's going to be able to sign a transaction for most parachains. Um, kind of signing things in sequence. I think Anton described it quite well earlier, where you really need to wait for the transaction A to be finalized before crafting transaction B and signing it and sending it and so on and so forth. There is a huge topic that the Jonathan just like revealed <laughs> to discuss, but it's not uh, related to the cross-chain. It's more about the multi-chain and how you, as a wallet, um, derive the accounts for each network, because right now, um, basically, I agree that, yeah, we take one account, right, and we just use the same um, address to, to be derived for each network. But this is not the way how other wallets do, uh, the multi-chain one. Uh, they usually use derivation path in addition to this, which results in more privacy-protected uh, approach for the managing your accounts on multiple chains. So. Sorry, your Polkot account cannot uh, be derived from your Kusama account, right? Because there is a derivation path which uh, results in a completely different address. Just wanted to add this, but this is not the topic to discuss because it's another one hour uh, agenda. Yeah, that, that's single chain applications. <laughs> All right. Um, with that said, I will wrap it up for today. It was a pleasure again to be with you, with you guys on this panel. Great discussion. Um, thanks you. A round of applause for all your insights, for all the panels. <laughs>